Right, I think we should start. Um, so um, my name is uh, Bartek Kiepuszewski. I work for MakeItDAO, and uh, uh, my engineering team is primarily responsible for maintaining uh, IZ stacks. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this and uh, uh, just present a bit of a history. Uh, just look at the uh, current market uh, of Texas. And I think my take is a little bit different than what uh, you are used to here. So uh, that's not going to be very technical, but uh, I'll try to make it a little bit entertaining. And uh, most of the data that I'm going to show comes directly from blockchain, so that cannot be tamed. And uh, you can check it for yourself. So um, and and also the future, right? So I, I think that the main question that we keep asking ourselves uh, as uh, the team that's uh, responsible for. Uh, for the DEX is why do we do this? You know, who's actually using the DEX, and and what is the the reason uh, for the DEX to become actually quite uh, popular? Uh, so maybe the first question for the audience. Uh, I mean, I know some uh, familiar faces, actually people who uh, technically know uh, much better than me how it works. But uh, uh, who hasn't heard about the Oasis DEX at all? Like it's the first time. So it's like literally everyone, right? Okay, so I find it actually quite surprising because you know, if you go to, to, to different tools, and I'm going to show you it uh, later, uh, Oasis is almost never mentioned. You know, it's kind of like as if we did not exist. So let's have a look at, the, at a bit of a history, and I'm going like, to uh, do it very quickly because I think that most of you actually are part of this history, but uh, it's a bit of a time travel, and I'm going to introduce the main players. Um, so I think that... Uh, we had like maybe four phases of, uh, of crypto. Uh, the first one I call humble beginnings. And uh, that may be actually some, uh, very surprising to some people, but Oasis was first deployed in April uh, 16. Uh, so the first contract uh, that was written there, it was very, very simple. And it allowed for MKR ETH uh, trading. And I think that nobody outside the maker community knew about this. And uh, the whole maker community was maybe, I don't know, 20 people. Uh, maybe 25. Uh, I'm not really sure because I wasn't part of this community at that time, right? Uh, and uh, a few months later, uh, Ether Delta was uh, deployed, and uh, uh, they had a very, very different approach. Uh, they actually marketed this, you know, broadly in the community, and uh, and because they were marketed uh, actively uh, and they traded every single token that was in existence, they quickly became number one, right? But that's the phase where. Uh, the crypto was like almost non-existent, right? And then the famous 17 happened, uh, lots of ICOs, uh, and in crypto space, uh, suddenly we started to have a lot of different competing projects and competing ideas. Uh, so Bancor, for example, they raised uh, $153 million. There was a huge ICO uh, sometime in June. Uh, then ZeroX, uh, Kyber, um, Airswap, uh, so you, you, probably a lot of you remember, you know, it was crazy, uh, really. And, and I think that apart from ICOs, uh, a lot of people sort of, you know, uh, were looking for a better design, right? At that time, Oasis uh, architecture was extremely simple and, and simplistic, I, I should say, because it was fully 100% uh, on-chain uh, DEX, right? So everything is on-chain on Oasis. The, uh, the order book, the, uh, the matching engine, uh, the whole thing is on chain, it's written as a smart contract, and uh, most people sort of looked at it, you know, and said that, no, that's never going to work, right? It cannot work because it's just slow, it's expensive, and uh, it's cumber to, cumbersome to use, it's very difficult to write a UI around it, so we need much better design, we need, we need much better ecosystem, and... And, uh, and, and this is, in my opinion, how many of the projects started, right? You know, they looked at uh, existing designs and they sort of, you know, tried to come up with something new. Uh, so the interesting one, uh, I think, is IDEX. Uh, they went a little bit different route, right? Uh, they looked at Ether Delta. They, I think they copied the design, but sort of, you know, centralized it a bit. And, uh, and after a while, you know, they claimed to be a number one exchange. And in fact, you know, to this day, I think they, uh, they sort of claim that, right? And uh, if you look at some of the statistics, you may actually be thinking that this is the case. Uh, so, uh, and they did ICO as well after a while, right? So in my opinion, at that time, uh, what was happening with Oasis? Uh, so September, right in the middle of this I, uh, ICO craze, uh, we had a major upgrade and we actually introduced the matching engine. 
the matching engine was sort of plugged in into the contract and uh, it made that thing much more com complex, right, and complicated. And I do remember uh, several conversations from uh, that day that people said that the cast price that you have to pay for the matching on chain is just too high. So again, uh, this argument that's never going to work, you know, was very prominent at that time. And in fact, you know, this contract uh, that we still use uh, till today, it's got this uh, kind of a rescue uh, switch button. Uh, so if the matching suddenly breaks, you know, we can go back to, to the version without matching, right? We never use this button, uh, but, uh, but that's what it's for, essentially, right? Because so many people just had doubts that uh, uh, if it's ever going to work. And I think this uh, whole phase sort of ends uh, um, surprisingly when Ether Delta is actually sold, right? So Zach Coburn sells uh, Ether Delta to Chinese investors, and you know at that time community was really furious, and uh, they kind of forked the UI, they forked the code base, and uh, and yeah, we're gonna see later what happens with those Chinese investors because you know it's a story uh, I think very interesting as well. Then, uh, of course, the crypto winter, right? Uh, phase three. Uh, some protocols actually launched during this time, funded in 17. Uh, but a lot of pivoting, I think, happened, right? And I think, like, from the, uh, from, uh, the perspective of decentralized exchanges and decentralized trading, uh, to me, the, the biggest pivot was Banker. Uh, they, they had this vision uh, of... Um, <laughs> smart token that should be like a reserve for, for, for smaller cap tokens for a long tail. Uh, that actually never happened, in my opinion, and they sort of pivoted into this, you know, bonding curve, uh, crypto to crypto exchange, uh, which then, a few months after, you know, was essentially uh, copied by Uniswap, uh, but Uniswap uh, simply doesn't use a, a token, right? Uh, but it's very, very similar design, I think. Uh, but this is not uh, Bunker's original design and original vision. I mean, if you read the original white paper, you'll see that uh, the goal and the, uh, the promise of Bunker was to actually create a reserve token for other currencies, right? But no one wanted that. Uh, so, yeah, how do you spend $150 million, right? <laughs> if you are funded, you know, to do something that no one wants, you know, that's a bit of a dilemma, I think. Uh, so, interestingly, also, they got hacked, right? And that gives us a lot of you know, insight into how do you govern you know, such projects. Uh, they got hacked and they essentially, uh, yeah, I'm going to go back you know, to this incident, but you know, some $13 million uh, worth of tokens were stolen. And uh, they, I think they actually managed to rescue some of them by freezing these tokens, right? So, uh, and then they said that this is why you know, you've got all these backdoors in the contracts, right? Because if, you are, if you get hacked, then you can somehow recover, you know, the stolen funds, right? But then, of course, uh, you're back to the question: How decentralized are you? You know, if you actually have these uh, capabilities. Um, well, I think the most important event of uh, 18, uh, from our point of view, uh, was what happened with Ether Delta. I mean, they were like the first one, and then the most interesting things again were happening in their camp. Uh, in this particular case, ACC charged uh, founder Zach Coburn with operating an unregistered security exchange, and uh, he came to some sort of a settlement with them, and without going into the details of the whole story, essentially that scared a lot of people, right? Uh, to the point that IDEX, you know, almost immediately announced that they're going to introduce KYC, and uh, and I think they've just done that in August, right, uh, this year. So, so now they uh, they essentially KYC the exchange, and everyone else uh, kept asking themselves, okay, what does it mean for us? You know, we obviously at Maker, you know, were asking ourselves, I mean, what do we do? I mean, do we close the whole thing down? Do we close Maker down? Uh, is that the end of decentralized projects at all, or do we go? Uh, the opposite way, right? And uh, and again, I think that at that time uh, I was really impressed by the, uh, the the interview on one of the podcasts with uh, Hayden Adams, who essentially said that you know, in his opinion, and he's uh, essentially based in New York, which is like probably the worst place, right, to be based in this uh, regulatory environment. He said that uh, he does not think that you can uh, regulate the protocol uh, because he's like 
designed to be fully decentralized, right? And uh, there's no operator. Anyone can launch the exchange, and like, he's not launching these exchanges. Uh, Uniswap is a protocol. I mean, each one of you can launch the exchange, you know, and we looked at our protocol and sort of we realized, well, I mean, we've been doing this from the beginning, right? I mean, and this is why we were so criticized, because if you're decentralized, uh, then you can get hacked and we can't do anything about it, right? I mean, uh, if you're fully decentralized, you can solve all sorts of problems that centralized exchanges don't need to solve. Uh, if you're decentralized, you're probably very slow and uh, you're expensive, you know, to be operated, but you are decentralized, right? So, so maybe there's some good to it. Uh, maybe. I mean, we didn't know, but you know, we sort of felt that uh, maybe this decision that we took two years ago, maybe it wasn't such a bad one, right? And maybe uh, the fact that you know we're like 100% on chain is actually a good thing. Who knows? I mean, we would have to look at uh, users, right? We would have to look at how many people are actually using the exchange and and see what happens. Because again. Uh, we didn't have any marketing at all, right? So I, I think that at the time still almost no one knew about Oasis and, uh, and most analytical sites kept ignoring us, right? And also I think the interesting uh, event of uh, the end of 18 uh, from this uh, you know, ecosystem uh, point of view is the fact that DDEX actually left uh, 0x. Uh, ecosystem and they created a tokenless version so the Uniswap was one and the DDEX was another one and sort of you know uh, got us thinking that again maybe our decision to not to have a token in an exchange wasn't such a bad one right because it's just so easy I mean if you think about your exchange as a protocol rather than an entity that you operate then it's very easy for people to actually you know copy paste your protocol and and sort of run in a decentralized way a tokenless version right so how do you sort of shield yourself from that uh, how do you protect your protocol, right? That it's not forked as easily. And maybe uh, having a token uh, as part of this protocol for payments or whatnot, you know, maybe it's not such a good idea. Maybe you should uh, find some other ways of monetizing, you know, uh, whatever you do, right? And yeah, this year, I mean, this year uh, hasn't finished yet. So, you know, we'll see what's going to happen. But, uh, but I think it's more or less a year of the <coughs> maturing markets, right? We, uh, see a lot of interesting things as well. Uh, so, well, like in our camp on Oasis, we actually uh, took oasisdex.com down as such, right? And we launched almost immediately the if2die.com as a new front end that focuses uh, exclusively on, on, on trading if and die. I mean, we just wanted to make sure that we don't uh, sort of, you know, uh, trip into any regulatory issues and we were certain that uh, neither an if nor die is a security and that was pr the primary reason why we actually did that right so we wanted the front end to be uh, to be uh, uh, safe uh, but the back end remained decentralized as such I mean anyone can trade uh, on the back end whatever they want interestingly uh, and this is this is uh, something that really puzzles me uh, no one does. I mean, interestingly, even though anyone can uh, launch their own UI, anyone can essentially create their own UI, I mean, the, the protocol is permissionless, uh, almost exclusively things that are traded are traded that are actually available through our UI, uh, which essentially, I think, says that uh, people do need a trusted UI, right? I mean, they do need a place where they can actually go and uh, they need to make sure that whether they, they click on the UI, it actually does what it says that it does, right? And then when you confirm the MetaMask transaction or not, you know, you're not like being uh, cheated or, or in any way. So, uh, but there's nothing in the protocol as such that, uh, that prevents users to trade whether they want, right? Um, but some other interesting thing happened in the Xerox camp. Well, first of all, uh, Paradex was uh, bought by Coinbase and then they lost a lot of liquidity. So it seems like uh, it's a strange uh, buyout, in my opinion, right? I mean, why do you buy an exchange and then you, know, you don't care about it at all? And, uh, and I think in, in many people's views, you know, this was probably one of the best relayers uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, then another relayer launches called uh, Tokenlon. How many of you have actually heard about Tokenlon? Okay, that, that, that's good. That's nice because, you know, frankly, I, I have not uh, heard about them before. And uh, it seems to me that this is, this, is, this is just an example that, you know, if people say like Xerox is almost dead, you know, nothing's happening there, you know, suddenly you've got this new business model that, uh, that 
turns out to be huge, right? I mean, they quite quickly overtook the uh, radar relay, and uh, as far as I understand, you know, now they like number one uh, in a space, which is kind of amazing. You know, came out almost out of nowhere, and and uh, and then number one, right? Uh, and it just says that you know. Uh, it's not that easy to, to come up with a good business model, and, uh, and it's, it's just such a uh, nice and space in a way. Uh, and anyone with a good idea, you know, can join the community and do something spectacular, right? And we'll see examples of that. Uh, many more examples uh, I'm going to show you uh, in 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 few minutes. Um, then they had to um, upgrade Xerox protocol because they found a bug, but uh, maybe this is not uh, as crucial to our story. It just says that uh, maybe some protocol governance is also required because, you know, what do you do if something like this happens, right? I mean, who should be responsible for upgrading protocol if something like this happens? And by the way, we had to upgrade our protocol as well uh, due to a bug. We had this incident in February this year. and. Um, the most troubling thing for, for me personally is that uh, it was just right after the audit. Um, so that's kind of worrying, right? And uh, this is one of the many reasons why a maker for Multicultural Die sort of made the decision uh, much earlier, but still uh, made a decision that uh, all core maker contracts will be formally verified. And I think this is something that uh, a project with so much collateral held in a smart contract should really seriously think about it, right? Because uh, I think um, a lot of people, after being audited, uh, found problems. So it's not just us, right? But, you know, we sort of experience it ourselves. And, uh, and it's just something that you have to think about uh, when you design a protocol. Um, yeah, and on the Ether Delta ca uh, camp, um, Apparently, uh, 500 ETH stolen from Cryptopia has been moved to EtherCamp. So, so again, you know, there's some uh, thinking uh, of regulators. Uh, what do we do with this? You know, how do we uh, introduce KYC AML into these uh, exchanges, into these protocols? And and I've actually talked to CoinFirm because it's a company that uh, they've got headquarters not far away from ours. And uh, to my astonishment, they treat decentralized exchanges uh, exactly the same as mixers, right? So they mark them as suspicious. They say, like, if you're an honest person, why would you use a mixer, right? What, what, what have you got to hide? And by the same token, you know, if you're an honest person, why would you use decentralized exchange and not like a decent KYC decentralized exchange? You know, why would you actually do that, right? And I kept like explaining to them, well, look, so many exchanges have been hacked, right? You know, it's a non-custodial. It's not about, you know, maintaining my privacy. It's about really the fact that uh, I want to make sure that the exchange does not run away from money, right? But for them, like, f uh, their logic is that the decentralized exchange and mixer is essentially the same thing. And if you ever run an AML report with one of these guys, you know, you'll see that uh, if your account is somewhat linked to decentralized exchange, you know, you'll be labeled as risky, right? Um, yeah, so that's just something that I think is interesting to know. Uh, and apparently, well, the new Chinese owners, they performed some sort of an exit scam on the token, and apparently the police is investigating, right? So, so this drama just doesn't, does, has not ended, right? It doesn't stop. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just amazing. I mean, the, 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 the whole community is full of, of such stories. Um, yeah, and the KYC by IDEX. So we'll see how that's going to work out. Uh, but that's that's more or less, you know, how I kind of see the ecosystem, right? So it keeps pivoting, it keeps changing, and uh, some protocols uh, they simply refuse to to go away. Um, so let's have a look. Oh, by the way, a side note: I sort of wanted to have a look at what what happened with those ICOs, right? That I've mentioned before from 17, and this is the data that I took yesterday from CoinMarketCap, so I don't trust CoinMarketCap much, but, but that's what they report. Uh, so yeah, um, it seems like uh, apart from ZeroX, uh, all the other protocols, it's more like a donation of sorts, right, rather than investment. Uh, I don't know. But that's what it looks like uh, today. Hopefully, that's going to recover <laughs> someday, but, but I think it sort of shows that you have to be really careful when you design a token, right? OK. so. Uh, Let's ask ourselves a question. Suppose that uh, you know you're running a DEX and uh, or, or you're just interested, right? And you want to see what the uh, what is the trading volume. So where do you go? Uh, and I, I 
I mean, we know how to do blockchain analytics, but let's suppose that you know you're like a casual user, you know, and you would like to to simply understand uh, where's the biggest trading volume, right? So I, I sort of kept asking my quest, uh, to myself, like, how do I find this information? I came up with the uh, essentially these uh, data sources that I wanted to, to, to sort of see what can I find. Like Etherscan is the obvious choice for anyone working with Ethereum, and luckily they've got this you know little section called DAX uh, <laughs> tracker or, or whatever, right? So we'll have uh, we'll have a look at this. Then of course we've got the Coin Market Cap, uh, DeFi Pulse, uh, my favorite. Uh, there's this uh, company called Dada Light uh, that does blockchain analytics, uh, the DEX Watch uh, by Consensus. Uh, and finally, we'll have a look at the blockchain itself because thankfully it's, it's like open, transparent, anyone can see, right? So each one of you can actually verify this data. So what do you see uh, on Etherscan? Well, I mean, essentially you go there and you'll see that the IDEX is like dominator, right? I mean, they're dominating clearly the whole market. Uh, there's Skyber, Token Loan, and surprisingly, uh, there's Oasis, uh, which wasn't the case, by the way, a month ago, but, you know, we we actually spent a few weeks uh, convincing them that we should be at it, and thankfully, we're here. Uh, the only problem is, well, the first question is, like, where's the Uniswap, right? I mean, all of you must have heard about the Uniswap. Why Uniswap is not here? I'm sure they're big, but how big they are, right? I mean, anyone knows, really? It's just that the intuition is that, you know, I mean, everyone working with DeFi has heard about Uniswap, right? Where's the Uniswap? Anyway, so you keep looking at this, you know, in a little bit more detail, and then you'll see that, well, they're reporting total number of transactions, right? So this is not volume. This is the number of transactions. What does it even mean, you know, the transaction? And what kind of transactions? Are we talking about any method call to the smart contract? Uh, are we talking only about the trade transactions? I mean, what are these, really? I can't find the answer for this. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, but I was intrigued. I looked at IDEX, you know, I wanted to see what, what is this volume. Uh, I couldn't find it on uh, Etherscan, so I had to look at the coin market cap. Uh, and I found that these are the tokens that uh, compose, like, I think 60% of the total volume in terms of transactions. So you've got the uh, QNT, you've got Lithium, Constellation, Capadex, VIDs, and Celsius, right? And, and uh, frankly, I mean, if you've never heard about them, you know, I mean, you're excused. <laughs> I have not, but it got me intrigued. Like, what are these tokens, right? So yeah, I took the Capadex because it sort of sounded funny. <coughs> and I, well, I started with the web page, and uh, yeah, that didn't tell me much. Um, <laughs> So I looked at the volume, right? At the coin market cap. Well, well I mean, there is some volume here. Uh, actually, you have to zoom really well to see this volume. It just turns out that you know they had some volume only two weeks ago, right? And before that, there was no volume at all, and that sounds so weird. Price chart. So I, I don't know what it is, frankly. But how a token like this uh, can comprise nine percent of the total volume, right? So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I lost confidence at all. I mean, I don't know what IDEX is doing, but you know, it's certainly something very interesting. Uh, but it's hard to say, really. Then I looked at the coin market cap. So that's actually not easy because you know, they don't allow you to, to list uh, decentralized exchanges. So you have to sort of go through the list. And I looked at the DAI market. And I found the top three, which is Kyber, IDEX, again, interestingly, and DDEX. I mean, these were the top three uh, from coin market cap. And I looked at the volume, the 24 volume at that very day for ASIS DEX, right? So, uh, so that's, that's like the top three according to coin market cap uh, from uh, decentralized exchanges. At the same time, ASIS DEX had 700, whereas Kyber had 100 and uh, IDEX 21,000, right? So again, the question is, you know, where is Oasis? Where is Uniswap? Where is everyone, <laughs> really? I mean, they seem to be showing like all the selected exchanges, right? And, uh, and, and this is like a very selected data. Uh, it's impossible to get a feel uh, for, you know, what the, uh, the DEX volumes are uh, using CoinMarketCap. Maybe there are some other trackers, but CoinMarketCap, frankly, it's uh, not very helpful. Uh, so I looked at the DeFi Pulse, right? <laughs> So this is probably the most hilarious. We see, uh, well, that's a good thing. Finally, we see Uniswap. That's the first one that we actually see Uniswap, and it's number one, which is good, I guess, because it's sort of, you know, uh, consistent with my intuition that they might be number one. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, where's everyone else, right? 
um, why uh, DeFi policy is not showing other exchanges. Uh, maybe. This is for total value locked? Yes. In the decks? Okay, well, some don't lock. Yeah, we lock. Yeah, yeah we lock, and uh, it takes literally two lines of code to see how much we lock. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the type balance, our address. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? Nothing else. Nothing can be simpler than that. You know, you can actually go to the ether scan. You can like type, uh, copy paste the address of our exchange. You know, on the die token, and you see exactly you know how much how many tokens are locked. And uh, we also lock uh, WETH, and you can see exactly right uh, how much is locked. So, so yeah. So I don't take this excuse that it's complicated. You know, I mean that may be true for zero X because you know they've got a little bit different model, and you have to look at the. Um, off-chain API to actually see the depth of the order book, but uh, not with Oasis, right? And it's got nothing to do with the fact that Oasis got some order book. Um, DexWatch, that's a good one. Uh, I like actually DexWatch. I mean, the user interface is superb, and uh, I think there's a lot of potential with DexWatch. Uh, so I look at DexWatch, and uh, the top three is IDEX again, uh, Kyber, and us at number three, which I was really happy to see, finally. Um, but it sort of made me thinking that this volume, the ETH, uh, this is 24 uh, hour DEX activity, that's huge. That's 54,000 ETH traded. Uh, that's 2.5 mil, which seemed quite odd. So I checked CoinMarketCap and uh, their number is very, very different. So I went to IDEX themselves and yet again, different number, right? How can that be? I mean, how is it possible, right? That, you know, IDEX says that 24 hour volume is 650 and uh, at the same time, uh, DEX uh, watch uh, says that it's 54,000 uh, uh, ETH, which is like five times uh, that figure. So I, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm more than happy to, to talk to the DEX watch people, you know, maybe I, I, I'm sort of missing something here, but, but again, you know, it makes you think like, uh, this is blockchain, right? I, Everyone should come up with the same data. Why people just don't come up with the same data? Um, yeah, and the last one is the, uh, the Data Light analytics platform. They published a report uh, about DEXs and they showed the 24 hour volume of different DEXs and, and, and quite, quite a lengthy report, right? And it turns out, uh, and by the way, we're looking only at the Ethereum based DEXs, right? But it turns out that number one by far uh, is something called Etherflyer. Uh, who has heard about the Etherflyer? Oh, nice. Okay, I, I have not, right? So, you know, I'm curious. So I, I, I checked. I looked. Who are these guys? I mean, and, and are they Ethereum? Because maybe they're not Ethereum, and so it doesn't count, right? Um, oh, yeah, and I checked on CoinMarketCap. They seem to be legit. CoinMarketCap, you know, reports them quite well, and it's huge. I mean, look at this. OMG, 24-hour volume is $70 million, right? traded AMG tokens. That's pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, so I went to the Etherflyer uh, web page and I learned a few things about the smart contract that I didn't know before. And maybe you didn't either. Um, so for example, uh, using the latest technologies uh, with hardware acceleration and memory matching technology, you can actually increase the transaction speed to hundreds or even thousands of times of the centralized exchanges. Now, that, that's weird, right? I mean, decentralized is not known for the speed. I mean, <laughs> it's known for a lot of things, but not the speed. And, and a lot of really smart people are actually trying to figure out, you know, how to make them faster. But these guys have figured it out, right? I mean, clearly they have, you know, and it's all because of the smart contract on Ethereum. Because they say that, the, I mean, look at this. Um, everyone knows what a smart contract is, but many people do not realize that they are form far more than just automated transactions. You know, they can send messages, they can read, write values. They just make them an active network component and a very powerful part of an agile dynamic system. I felt kind of dumb, you know, when I was reading this because, you know, most of our smart contracts are not that smart, <laughs> in fact. So I tried to find this smart contract because, you know, I thought that, you know, these guys could figure it out, but I couldn't. <laughs> I did not. I mean, maybe you know where they are, right? But you know, I couldn't find a single smart contract, and I, frankly, I couldn't find a single Ethereum transaction that is actually done by these guys. So I don't know. So I tried to set up an account, and that didn't go well either. <laughs> they tried to send a SMS code to my phone. You know, they they uh, I think that they were trying to do something really weird, and also their candles 
didn't look that well. <laughs> So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you guys have a lot of you know experience with trading, but but this this doesn't look good. <laughs> Such candles, I don't know. I mean, so I couldn't trade. So I don't know. Maybe if you guys know them, you just let let me know what's happening there because I'm I'm lost. Yeah. So so I kind of did this you know first manual thing you know because remember I was still trying to figure out like what is the volume traded. Uh, finally, we looked at the blockchain. So. <laughs> Uh, so it's a bit of a spoiler, right? But yeah, but let's have a look. Let's have a look at just one day. So I look at this uh, uh, different uh, stats that I had, and, uh, uh, and, and and frankly, this is the conclusion that I got by looking at different analytical tools and then sort of discarding uh, the the numbers that seemed very very off, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that this list uh, it's more or less. Uh, more in line with my personal intuition. I'm not really sure if that's more in line with your intuition, but you know, it turned out that you know, on this particular day, uh, according to the data that's sort of consistent between different uh, analytical sites, uh, the biggest trading volume uh, is Uniswap, which is kind of amazing, given that the protocol is quite new and is fully decentralized and doesn't have a matching engine as such, right? And, uh, and yet, you know, a lot of people Clearly, a lot of people are using this. And then uh, Oasis Dex and Kyber comes like almost second. And then we've got IDEX and uh, Token Loan, Bancor, Radar Relay, uh, and, and, and some others as well. Uh, so that's how I see the volume. And you have to remember that uh, all these protocols, except Oasis Dex, they seem to trade a lot of different tokens. We only trade through our UI, we only trade if and die, right? So I look at the if and die because uh, that's not such a fair comparison, in my opinion, um, since we only have one trading pair. Uh, so if and die on that very day look, uh, looks more like this. Uh, so now Oasis Dex is like by far the biggest uh, exchange in terms of volume. Uh, Uniswap comes second, and then there's Kyber. Uh, rather relay and air swap. That's for if and die. And I think this pair is actually quite important because it's an important pair for DeFi as such, right? This is actually uh, a pair that's used for uh, when you liquidate uh, your CDP. Uh, this is the pair that's used by many ARB bots. Uh, this is actually something that you would use when you uh, will open uh, long or short position on the YDX and whatnot, right? So that's actually quite heavily traded pair with real use uh, cases. Uh, no one's like wash trading Keef and Dai. It doesn't make sense. I mean, Dai is a stable coin, right? For starters, and secondly, uh, I mean, if you look at who's actually trading, you'll see that you know these are like very legitimate use cases, right? And, and this is, I think, this volume more or less rep represents the current st uh, state of the market for uh, for Eve and Dai trading uh, on chain. I mean, again, we're talking about you know, Ethereum transactions, decentralized exchanges, right? Um, so one note about Kyber, a uh, wonderful protocol, uh, allows other smart contracts to do a very simple uh, price discovery uh, between different uh, reserve pools. Uh, so I'm sure that most of you know how Kyber works, but just to remind you, it essentially uh, gives you a proxy that if you uh, have, uh, if you want to trade tokens, it will kind of look at different reserves and it will try to, to find the best price for you and uh, it will do it automatically, so it's almost like a routing engine, uh, but also they, they also have their own reserve, right? So, so when you think about tokens sort of locked in Kyber, I mean, I, I think you should probably think about this because you know, these reserves uh, are just proxies to other protocols, right? Uh, but you may be wondering uh, how much of the volume of Kyber volume is actually uh, sort of going through uh, each individual reserves. And the answer is more or less this. Uh, so I think they own the reserve contributes more or less 10% of the liquidity as such. And uh, the rest is split between uh, Uniswap and Oasis, right? So Kyber, for us, <laughs> it's, a, it's an excellent entry point to our protocol. And again, I'll come back uh, to this point uh, later when we sort of try to uh, show side by side uh, how the Oasis compares to, uh, uh, to Uniswap. And oh, by the way, you can, you can have a look at uh, such transactions. So, uh, so this, is, this is just an example transaction uh, from uh, using Kyber. 
uh, the way it works is essentially, uh, yeah, this is the trace of the transaction. It, someone, uh, I guess the sender, you know, they, they uh, issued the transaction to, to Kyber Network Proxy and, and it essentially you see that it gets the uh, uh, conversion rate from each individual exchange, right? So first they own reserve as Dutch X here, um, there's uh, Oasis, uh, Uniswap, and uh, yeah, Kyber Reserve, and eventually, you know, it comes with the uh, price and it does the trade uh, on the best one. It just happens, yeah. Uh, can I ask, maybe you can finish this, and I have a question to the previous slide. Uh, sorry, can you use the mic and ask a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we'll come back to the questions, right? And uh, the previous slide, uh, uh, yeah, I'll come back to the presentation in a sec, right? Uh, the actual trade on ISIS happens here. So this is the matching market, that's Oasis, right? It does the take here, and you can also see, you know, how much gas is spent for each individual transaction. So, so the, the actual take uh, requires you to spend 72,000 uh, gas, and the whole transaction, um, yeah, the whole gas transaction is here, right? So it's like 400,000 gas for, for this discovery, I guess. Uh, but I guess you know it's 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 okay uh, if you're looking for, a, for 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 the best price uh, between those uh, these five uh, liquidity providers. That's interesting. What is loading? It shouldn't load. It should just present. Okay. I don't want you to load. Oh, okay. What was your question? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so I was curious about uh, uh, those funnels because you have two uh, main ones that they are the Oasis, uh, the Oasis and the Uniswap. But uh, I was confused about the Kyber Reserve and the Kyber Order Book. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference between those two? To, to me, we would, would say the same, but. I'd say that you know uh, this is just a proxy. Uh, it essentially asks you know Oasis uh, treats Oasis or the book uh, as a reserve essentially, right? And uh, it it asks Oasis for the current best price and uh, and eventually execute the trade. Uh, this one uh, actually is the own implementation of the uh, on-chain order book. That's how I would sort of uh, uh, describe it. And this one uh, is the. Uh, the reserve that uh, market makers can uh, manage themselves um, kind of semi-manually, I'd say. So they set the price uh, for this reserve. So it kind of works uh, as if, you know, if you were the owner of this reserve, you would be able to say, well, there's this much uh, DAI or ETH that, you know, I can sell or buy and this is my price for this amount and maybe you can even uh, create your own bonding curve. Uh, so you can say that, you know, this amount I can sell for this much and, you know, if the amount is bigger, you know, then I can sell for this much uh, and, and you can essentially create your own pricing algorithm, right? So, so this one would expose to, to the manager of the reserve the methods allowing you to set the price, essentially. And if the price is better than on all the other reserves, then the routing engine will essentially uh, take uh, tokens from, from here, right? But if the price is worse, then the tokens will be taken from one of the, the two. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so if you adjust the Kyber volume, if you sort of, you know, uh, take away that volume, because, you know, that's kind of volume that they brought to Oasis and Uniswap, but it's not the volume that they serve, then suddenly this, this picture looks a little bit different, right? Okay, so, so I think that the main question, and this is why we're here, is sort of, you know, we keep asking ourselves why. Why, even though there's like almost no marketing, you know, why everyone is using Oasis? What is the reason? And uh, I sort of came up with three hypotheses, and I'm not really sure, you know, if they're true, but, but this is essentially uh, how we kind of think about it. Well, first of all, uh, Oasis is fully permissionless protocol, right? And I think this is, this is like the, the crucial thing. Why this is important? Uh, I mean, everyone probably would agree that if you transfer tokens between two Ethereum accounts, there should be no KYC. I mean, the only way to do to actually introduce KYC when sort of uh, two people, right, exchange tokens would be to do it at the Ethereum level. That's just never going to happen. I mean, no sane regulator, they would have to shut down Ethereum, basically, right? So the logic, and I'm not going to go into the detail, but, you know, I'm very much open to this discussion, is that the logic 
is that if you sort of complicate it a little bit, like you know, if you create something like a WEF contract, WEF contract is something that you send tokens to, I mean ETH, and uh, the contract sort of means WEF, right? That's it. I mean, it's like, I don't know, 50 maybe lines of code. I mean, not much more than that. And then there's quite a lot of ETH actually logged, right? That's, uh, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the contract stores $324 million the last I checked. And it's, it's a lot of value and no one can access it. And, and obviously, right, there's no operator of the WEF contract. Um, so you complicate this logic a little bit further, right? And you come to this simple peer-to-peer uh, -peer escrow smart contract where a person can post an offer, the other person can take this offer, and again, it's fully permissionless. There's no operator. And then, you know, you complicate it a little bit more and you come with something like Oasis, right? How do you, how do you regulate this? So our thesis is that, well, uh, you can't. There is no way you can regulate it, and uh, therefore it uh, will never have KYC. There's nothing to KYC. It's just impossible. I mean, if you, if you want it, you know, it can't be done. If you introduce KYC at the protocol level, a week later, someone will kind of fork, and there will be KYC-less version of Oasis, right? So why would you even do this? You know, it just doesn't make sense. And, and the fact that this is uh, permissionless, and it's not operated. I think this is actually one of the reasons why Oasis and Uniswap are so popular these days. And apparently, there is a huge need for this, right? Um, the second, and by the way, uh, if you think that other protocols are uh, decentralized, well, you might think again. I mean, Compound, great protocol, by the way, is holding quite a lot of assets, but it's definitely a custodial system, and uh, it's centrally managed. Uh, they can upgrade. Uh, the, the, the protocol and they could do whatever they want, you know, in the upgraded version. Uh, and they say that the admin key will never be compromised, right? And so they say, I mean, Banker said that as well, uh, until the, it was compromised. I mean, they lost it, they stole it, uh, they, they were hacked. I mean, no one knows, right? It's just impossible to tell for us. So, so I think uh, that if you really want your decentralized exchange to be truly decentralized, you have to think about, you know, uh, how many backers do you have? Is it really non-custodial? Can you influence matching algorithm? Uh, can you censor certain users, right? I mean, if you can do all of this, if you can whitelist tokens, if you can blacklist tokens, if you take fees from listing tokens, ex you know, on exchange, I think at best you're hybrid, right? You're not fully decentralized. And that's not such a bad thing. I mean, it may be actually a good thing for you and for your protocol, but uh, for sure, you know, you run into this risk of being uh, <coughs> regulated in certain jurisdictions, right? Whereas if you have like pure protocol, I think that the risk is much lower. So which protocol I think today are truly decentralized? I would say that apart from Uniswap and Oasis, um, all the protocols that are governed by, by DAOs, you know, they very interesting case. Uh, because they're very different, you know, there is no this one central entity, so that uh, is true for DutchX, which is governed by DXDAO, that's true obviously for MakerDAO and for any other DAOs, but, but of course it's not crystal clear, right? I mean, uh, maybe some of you have heard about this drama and, uh, at the DigX DAO that happened a few days ago. It's not that easy, I mean, on-chain governance, uh, that's always going to be a challenge and, you know, it's a very, very challenging topic, right? And that's going to be true for, for all, all DAOs, I think. Uh, so we still have a lot of to learn, but at least, you know, we, want, we know what we want, right? <laughs> we want people to govern and not a central entity that benefits from it. Because if you are the central entity, then you will be regulated. Uh, the thesis number two uh, is actually the fact that it's uh, fully on-chain, uh, that actually makes it a very, very good building block for other DeFi projects uh, because they can do atomic transactions, right? And not just ARP bots. Uh, for ARP bots, it's ideal. I mean, they pay gas fee, true. I mean, it's costly. But on the other hand, these bots don't have any risk of only one lack of transaction failing. I mean, either both lack of transactions uh, succeed or they both fail, right? And that makes uh, it's very, very useful, I think, for arbitrage, and arbitrage, uh, uh, which is risk-free, and also a building block for DeFi as well. And I think it turns out that this is actually the case, because if you look at the trading volume, a function to the cost are not that great. The volume on Oasis really increased sometime in May, right? I mean, this is like made this year, and the volume 
like substantially increased. So what happened on May? I mean, we looked at the transactions and it turns out, and this is the breakdown of transactions, that's by the way the pure blockchain data, right? Uh, here, the, all the transactions on OASIS are actually uh, colored by the type of uh, the proxy uh, contract that's invoking them. So we look at the full trace and we look at the, how the transaction starts. And uh, again, as you can see, there's a new player uh, on May that, uh, that took quite a lot of actually liquidity. Uh, they pink. DYDX? Yeah, so this pink player is actually DYDX. And, uh, on some days, as you can see on this chart, this is actually daily takes volume by DYDX. And on that very day, for example, they contributed 4.5 mil of trading volume themselves. This is like 41% of the full volume on Oasis, right? Great news for market makers, I think, uh, because you know, they bring a lot of liquidity. And also the way they design the protocol is that, you know, uh, for market makers it's ideal because uh, essentially they're using market price, right? So they always take the best offer. If you open a long position, then you'll fetch uh, uh, the best offer on the other book. So, so this is, I think, ideal uh, for market makers. Uh, so the actual breakdown is, I think, quite interesting. Uh, so that's the total volume, and this is actually for the whole month of August, right? So that the total volume of OASIS can be divided into those three major uh, chunks. Uh, one, uh, so the green one, I think these are the users uh, of the exchange directly. So that includes uh, users uh, using our UI, that includes users uh, using uh, OASIS direct or instant, or, uh, whatever the current name is, and uh, that, that will also include uh, users uh, running uh, arbitrage bots, but off-chain, without smart contracts, right? So smart contracts are here, and as you can see, it's almost half, and the majority of that is DYDX, but there's also Kyber and, and others, and, and this part, 10%, is, is just arbitrage. Interestingly, arbitrage with 0x, arbitrage with Uniswap, and arbitrage with Bancor, and of course, the reason for that is that uh, these are the only protocols that today you can arbitrage with on-chain, right? If you've got off-chain arbitrage with like centralized exchange and decentralized exchange for us, it will be a direct take because you know we won't be able to this, we won't be able to see that off-chain part. Uh, so, how does it look like from from their point of view? I mean. Uh, for that very month, uh, the total volume was 43 million on Oasis, and, uh, and for us, like I said before, about 10% is arbitrage. And for ZeroX, for example, uh, that's almost like more than a third. So mo mo more than a third of the volume is arbitrage between us and ZeroX, right? And for Uniswap, it's like 15%, more or less. And again, I mean, we're looking uh, if die, uh, nothing else, right? So this is just one trading pair. Uh, yeah, so like I said, I mean, fully on-chain, I would say Oasis, Dex, Uniswap, Banker, Kyber, you can do both reads and writes on-chain. Then you've got hybrid, you can do reads uh, off-chain, but you can do write on-chain, so it's actually quite suitable for, for that type of arbitrage. And that's either Delta and uh, ZeroX open order book layers. And with these guys, you have to do off-chain arbitrage, so we, we won't be able to actually see that that's what's happening, and it's just hard to see. And, and frankly, I'd be very happy to hear some ideas, you know, how to uh, distinguish such uh, transactions. Um, I, I guess it's possible, but you would have to sort of, you know, have some sort of heuristics when you compare two different transactions happening, you know, more or less close times, like say between say IDEX or DDEX and, and OASIS, but you wouldn't be able to easily link them uh, just by the fact that they're part of the same transaction. And uh, the third thesis is that uh, we were always very conscious about liquidity, right? Uh, so, I think that market makers uh, need to find some sort of a sweet spot between you know, uh, big spreads that uh, gives them a lot of profit and trading volume because you know, the thinner spreads, the bigger trading volume, right? So you, know, you have to find the sweet spot somehow. But the truth is that uh, market makers uh, and the more competition, you know, they, that result in tighter spreads and that result in bigger taker volume because more and more people are actually using you know, this order book because it offers the best price on the market. Uh, and more takers means more profit opportunities for market makers, right? So because of DYDX, because you know, of such a big volume that they brought, uh, I think that's opportunity for makers to make money, uh, which means, again, that you know, there'll be more transactions, right? So it's kind of like a positive 
uh, uh, feedback loop. Uh, and we were always very conscious about this, and uh, we never sort of designed the protocol and let it be, right? Uh, so Maker Foundation always uh, made uh, significant efforts to, to make sure that uh, the order book is actually liquid. And, and this is one of the reasons why we don't trade many pairs, right? We're not interested in having order books that are not liquid. And the if die uh, is important. Like I said before, it's important for Maker ecosystem as such, and this is the main reason why Maker Foundation is actually uh, invested, you know, into this effort, right? Uh, the, the liquidity of DAI and uh, the liquidity of other collateral, once we launch multi-collateral DAI, that's just something that, that is a fundamental uh, part of the ecosystem, in my opinion. So how does this R bot work? Uh, for example, this is the example transaction that I can show you later. Uh, the, the bot can buy MKR on ISIS, uh, then uh, it can sell this MKR for ETH on Uniswap, and that Eve that is bought from Uniswap, again, it exchanges on ASIS for DAI, right? So it starts with DAI, and it ends with DAI. And, and, and this is the transaction that, uh, that you can actually see. So this is like a three-pronged arbitrage, in a way. Um, the end result essentially is $10, 10, 10 for, for the transaction. May not be much, but you know, if you've got this $5, $10 tripping into your account every minute or so, you know, that seems like quite a nice way to earn your lunch, I think. Um, and also, you know, to have a full understanding of how it works, we actually, uh, we were so dissatisfied with the uh, uh, tracing tools that we wrote our own, and, uh, and uh, we are, again, more than happy to, to sort of, you know, uh, have you guys look at your transactions, right, and help us improve this tool. The whole idea about this tool is to actually add some semantic layer on top of the, the pure blockchain layer, so not only we show the pure trace, like Etherscan and whatnot, uh, but we also kind of interpret uh, certain transactions, right? So, so we, can, we can actually see um, in details what's going on. Uh, that's this transaction. So you, you can see events, which are a little bit interpreted. Uh, you can see also the state diffs, which is kind of interesting. You can define uh, your own contract and, you know, the tool will track exactly every single field, whether you uh, expose it via some function or not, it doesn't really matter because we look at the Patricia tree directly and we sort of look at the state tree directly, right? So, um, so every single thing that you store in the contract that's going to be displayed here, nothing's hidden, uh, it doesn't matter if you publish your code or not, right? <laughs> it will be shown. And, uh, and, and by looking at these transactions, we can essentially uh, do some categorization, right? And, and, we can, and we can see exactly what's going on on the blockchain. And of course, uh, so, so yeah, so we've got events, we've got state diffs, uh, yeah, we've got account balances, so you can see exactly what's going on with the balances and what is the, uh, the, the final result of the transaction, coin transfers, and finally the execution trace, uh, which you can see that this bot, not only that, you know, they changed, uh, they, yeah, this is, this is the matching market take, then you've got the Uniswap, then you've got another take, and then uh, uh, they freed seven gas tokens, right, uh, as a dessert of sorts. I mean, clearly someone was very smart, you know, doing this, because not only did they yeah, earn some money, but they also did it in a very, very clever way. Uh, but we also uh, do some classification, right? So, you know, we know more or less that this is the arbitrage and, and this is how much, you know, they spend and, uh, and we can do some kind of a PNL analysis with this. But the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, if you really want to see the volume, you have to understand these protocols, right? I mean, you can't like simply look at the, the number of transactions. It's just not going to cut it. I mean, you have to understand the protocol, you have to know exactly what's going on with the IDX compound and whatnot, right? And uh, once you know that, then you can sort of uh, have some conclusions uh, about it. Is this um, by Maker? Uh, yeah, uh, I guess yes, yes, yes. I was hesitating a bit because it's kind of a collaborative effort, uh, but, but at the end of the day, yes. Okay. Uh, Final remarks, where do we go from here? So this is like a, uh, there should be a full presentation about this. Uh, so that's just like a hint of where we're going with Oasis after all this drama of previous years. Um, so essentially, uh, you guys all know that uh, the multi-collateral DAI is gonna be launched soon. 
Uh, and like I said, I mean, OASIS' main reason for existence is to provide liquidity for collateral. So we will be relaunching very, very soon OASIS so that you know, other tokens that will be used as a collateral can be traded uh, on DAI markets. Uh, so that's uh, point number one. Uh, and we also will add decentralized uh, leverage trading. It's not called margin trading for a reason. Uh, lawyers don't like us to call it margin trading somehow. I don't know why, but so we call it leverage trading. So you will leverage it yourself. Uh, if you trade on margin, apparently you borrow money from someone else. In this case, you borrow the money against your own collateral, right? Uh, so that's going to be relatively simple, but you know we want to make it very, very seamless and again, make sure that it's fully decentralized. Uh, and this is like a basic version. I mean, we also have a lot of ideas about pro version for, for users that uh, require much more, but uh, that would be like additional service that uh, requires some trust on our side because we will be, for example, risk balancing the, the accounts. Uh, and uh, to do that, uh, we very likely will require some sort of a uh, license to do financial advisory of sorts. And, uh, and that feature will be available only for, for KYC2 users. But, but all the others, you know, they will be able to do decentralized uh, leverage trading on AZ directly, right, using our protocol. Um, also, um, in the medium term, uh, we would love to have security tokens as a collateral and trading security tokens is much more complicated in many jurisdictions, especially in US. And for this, we will very likely require ATS license. And uh, we are in the process of actually doing this. And again, that will probably be available mostly to professional traders, right? Um, because that's not going to be as decentralized by definition. I mean, and we cannot. Uh, have it decentralized. S sorry. And of course, the various scaling solutions are also investigated. Sorry. Um, so that's we're running out yes. of time. Yes, and that was the last point. So Perfect. thank you for telling me, and uh, I'm sorry I uh, uh, took ten minutes more. Any sorry. quick questions? Thank you very much. So just a question. Um, what tools did you use to build all the charts we have seen? Is it like all completely done by Maker? Or did you use any other platform? And how did you get to blockchain data straight in? Uh, what, what tools did we use to do what? Sorry, I didn't. So you showed us a lot of the, all the charts. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all on chain there. Yes. Did you build all the tools? Yeah, no, so, so that's uh, like we try to use uh, different uh, tools, but we ended up writing our own. Uh, so at the end of the day, you know, we, we essentially cache uh, data that's, uh, that's useful for us. Uh, so in a way, it works more or less the same way as a Google Big Data set, but with some extra semantic layer. And we don't take all the data. We only take data that's interesting for us, right? So our caching layer is quite thin because of this, because we don't need to cache every single transaction like Google does. But uh, at the same time, we can add some extra semantic you know, interpretation to it. And sometimes it's actually quite involved and quite complex. Uh, and, and the idea is that uh, once we are interested in other protocols, we simply add new events, we add new state, uh, we add new state diffs uh, to this cache. And again, we provide some extra semantic uh, interpretation. And, uh, and I think this tool, you know, it proves uh, to us so useful and to other teams as well that uh, we're actually thinking about uh, generalizing it a little bit and uh, opening up uh, to the community and maybe making it more of a generic tool. And, and so goes with, the, uh, with this uh, transaction tracer. It's actually part of the same effort, right? Uh, this one.